Hello and welcome to Pathway Online. We are so glad that you could be with us today. And this week, as we celebrate the work of our hands and the fruit of our labor, let us also remember that God is our true provider and sustainer, and He is worthy of all our praise. So please join us now as we sing out to our good, good Father.
Hello again and thank you for joining us today. My name is Sam and it is so good to be with you. Now even though the sun may be setting on summer, fall is looking especially bright on our Chippewa campus and here are a few reasons why. Beginning this Tuesday, September 6th, all men and women are invited to join us for a Bible study through the book of Exodus. We'll come together for teaching and then the men and women will separate into smaller groups for further discussion and prayer. You can visit lifeatpathway.com to sign up today. Now, if you're nearing retirement age, then you don't want to miss our free financial seminar on Saturday, September 10th at the Chippewa campus. We've lined up a panel of experts who will share strategies and answer your questions about estate planning, trusts and wills, Medicare options, and funeral expectations. To learn more about this important gathering, you can call our church office and ask for Maddie. Now, unfortunately, we've seen it over and over again. 
The pain of divorce or separation can be awful. So please don't let another day go by without seeking help. Our next session of Divorce Care begins on Monday, September 19th at the Chippewa campus. This weekly support group is led by those who have experienced a broken marriage and we'd love to take you on a journey toward hope and healing. You can sign up today by calling our church office. And finally, if you're newer to Pathway and you'd like to learn more about who we are and what we offer, then we'd love to meet you at our Newcomers Luncheon on Sunday, September 25th. We'll gather in the cafe right after our second service and you can enjoy a free meal, some relaxing conversation, and ask us anything about our church. Now, let's once again prepare our hearts as we continue to worship our Heavenly Father.
God is present in the fires, and God is present in the waters, and God is present in the storm, God is present in the battle, God is present, and He is strong, and He stands strong in those places with us. There's something in the scriptures that's kind of unique. The, the strength of God is also, is all, a lot of times, you'll see it's connected with our stillness, or at least the encouragement for us to be still. And there's this idea of declaring that God's strength and that encouragement for us to be still. As if it's this reminder that when God's in it, which he always is, when God is present, which he always is, in those battles and in those, in those situations where, where we feel the fires, we can be still. It might be our temptation in those battles to pick up the sword do our part, stay busy, got to do what we need to do. It might be our temptation to pick up the sword and get in the battle, but actually the scriptures tell us to be still because God is strong and he's got it covered and he can take care of it. And that idea to be still means like to cease striving. It doesn't mean just to, just to do nothing. It just means to cease your striving. Stop fighting on your own. Let God be the one to fight the battle. When we think about his strength, consider how we are to be still. Exodus 14, 14 says, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. So as we sing this next song and consider God's faithfulness and consider the hope that we have in the Lord, I encourage you, to be still and declare his faithfulness, his goodness. We can rest in that. For God is with us.
Imagine you have 24 hours to live. What are you going to do? That question has been put to a lot of different people. Maybe you've responded to that question at some point in the past, and it prompts a variety of different responses to it from different people. And a lot of times, some of the responses are a bit indulgent, but I don't think anybody's going to fault you if, if you decide that you want to have orums for breakfast and lunch a la mode. <laughs> you ever thought about that? One of the cinnamon rolls heated up a la mode. That's probably pretty good. Somebody try that. Get back to me. Let me know how that, uh, how that is. I'm not sure exactly what you would do. I know for me, I'd make at least one last visit to Wampum. <laughs> Definitely do that. And one guy said this. He said, I would spend it at my office cubicle because in my office, every minute seems like a year. A lot of different ways that people would respond to a question like that, but I'm guessing that probably for pretty much all of us here that, that at some point we'd come around to saying, well, I would want to spend time with some of my friends and family, my spouse and my kids. Maybe you'd want to be generous toward somebody like you never had been before. Maybe seek some forgiveness or offer some forgiveness. Read some scripture and pray. Jesus knew he had about 24 hours to live, and when he did, he got to praying a lot. Prayed for a lot of different things. One of the things that he prayed urgently for, he kept coming back to, was for our unity. For our unity. He could have prayed for virtually anything for his followers, but several times he keeps praying that we would be one. That's pretty telling. It says a lot about Jesus. It says at least a couple of things that we can just see right off the surface. One of those is it tells us just how important unity, the unity that we would have with one another, the unity of the church, how important that is to Jesus. 
He knows that it's essential for our health. He knows it's essential for our growth, for our witness. In fact, in that prayer where he's praying for us, he prays this. He says, that they may all be one so that the world may believe that you have sent me. It's important for our mission. If we're united, it makes a difference in the world in which we live. And secondly, he also prayed for our unity because he knew how hard it would be for us to achieve. There are a lot of different opinions out there. We have different We have different mindsets. We come to issues from different avenues and different angles. And he knew that it would be difficult. The letter that we have been studying here, Romans, grace changes everything. The letter that we have been studying is written to this group of people in Rome, the church in first century Rome. They are people who had trouble finding unity. Church through the Middle Ages struggled with it. Certainly the church in the Reformation era struggled with unity. The church today continues to wrestle with this issue of of finding unity within the body, let alone between different bodies. Paul knew that the struggle was real, so he spends quite a bit of time in this letter addressing how people from different backgrounds and opinions and points of view, how we might be able to come together. Romans chapter 14 deals completely with that issue of how do we interact with one another when we have differences from one another. I'm grateful for Ben and Steve who over the last couple of weeks took you through all of those verses in Romans 14. Well, as we turn the page today to Romans 15, we see the very same thing continues to be on Paul's mind. And I invite you to turn to Romans 15, if you would, please. Romans 15, maybe you've got your scripture journal. I just love seeing so many of those journals still in your hands. That's awesome. That means so much to me. Or maybe you just have your Bible there with you and the outline, and and you can jot these things down while you're finding your way there. Welcome to everybody, whether you're live here in the room or whether you're listening online or in one of our venues, the classic venue, maybe the, the moon campus in your living room, wherever you are. Romans 15 is where we're going to be today. Welcome to you all. Now here, Paul is trying to get us to get this glimpse of what biblical unity would look like. And today we're going to be talking about unity on display. What does it look like? How do we get there? And as we look at unity on display, we're going to consider a few different things. We're going to consider these three. Where we need it, when we see it, and how we live it. And given all of what is swirling around us today in the world and in the church, I can hardly imagine a more urgent topic or one that is more salient for the, for the world and the context in which we live today. So Paul jumps into this, and as he does, he helps us understand how can we get and achieve this circumstance that seems as though it would be so very difficult, in fact, has proven to be so very difficult. Here's where he gets started. Where we need it, he says, is in our consideration of others. In our consideration of others. Paul is very plain in his prescription for us all. Verse 1, take a look at it, chapter 15. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. This is Paul's way of saying that we are to live in consideration of others. This is a message that is pretty countercultural in our world because what's the message of our world around us today? Isn't it that we would look to, to build up ourselves, to look to ourselves and consider ourselves and our own interests first and and foremost. And then maybe if there's something left over of time or something left over of a resource, maybe I might take and apply that into the situation for somebody else. But first, I'm going to look at myself. That's the message that we have all around uh, around us. But the true, genuine Christ follower turns that on its head and takes exactly the opposite approach to it. This is the same message that Paul wrote to the church in Philippi, which might be more familiar to you than Romans 15. There it says this, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interests of others. This is the mark of a genuine believer that we would have our head up and that we'd be looking out and that I'm not just considering myself, but I'm looking to you and I'm asking, what is it that the need might be here? What is it that this brother, this sister is walking through? And how might I be able to enter into their circumstance out of consideration 
for them. That's what Paul is telling us here in these verses. Now, specifically in this case, in Romans 15, Paul begins by talking about the interaction between the strong and, and the weak. The strong are those who have come to a place of greater spiritual maturity, greater spiritual wisdom. And we have those people in our midst today. The strong are those, oftentimes, that will lead them to a bit of a more nuanced understanding of debatable matters and sometimes give them a greater sense of freedom as, it, as they deal with some of those different matters. The weak aren't there yet. But Paul's heart isn't for the strong to flaunt that over the weak and say, you should be where I am, but rather for them to limit their expression of those freedoms that they might have so they, they might keep that brother or that sister that is weaker from stumbling. You say, well, I've earned my right as a strong person to do what I want to do. Yes, but Paul is saying, but that's not how you build unity. That's how you live selfishly. But he has a higher standard in mind for us all. Paul actually says here that this isn't just a good idea, but this is verse 1, if you noticed it, this is an obligation that we have. This is also a countercultural action because in our world we become strong so that we might use that to rule over people who haven't achieved our status yet. We know how that works. We see it in business. We see it in all different sorts of areas and realms of life. We know how hierarchy works. It works really well if you're the strong. If you're at the top of the pyramid, you know one thing that it doesn't do very well? It doesn't foster unity. It fosters division. And that same mindset, Paul is concerned, might creep into the church among those who consider themselves to be spiritually strong. And so he says, instead of flaunting that which you have achieved, use that to serve others. Servant leadership, that's what's all over the Scriptures. It certainly comes into play here in Romans 15. So Paul gives a different message to the strong, and that's to Not just live to please yourself, but consider others. And in order to do that, you've got to look at circumstances from the perspective of the other person. You've got to walk in their shoes, as it were. You've got to try to get yourself into their mindset and what they're dealing with, to consider them. I had a man in my last church. I was fresh out of seminary. I was 20-something, newly married. And this is a guy that Carol and I met on on an EE call. Some of you know what that is. Um, But we met him there, and we had great conversation with him. He ended up coming to the church, and and he was a guy who was very high up in administration at the Mayo Clinic and and all kinds of power kind of position. He's not the guy who just sort of gave off any air of really looking to the interests and the needs and the concerns of other people. That wasn't kind of his aura, but as I got to know him better and better and better, I saw that that very much was his, his makeup. He went on many, many different mission trips with us. He sponsored I don't know how many orphans in different places around the world. And then he'd come to me occasionally and he'd say, what I want you to do is take my luxury car and go use it for the day. Now, mind you, this luxury car probably costs more than my first house. But he's like all about just take it and use it and take Carolyn somewhere and, and go for the day and go as far as you want to go and enjoy it and have dinner and then just bring it back to me whenever it's convenient for you. And it's like, well, that's pretty cool. Now, never once did he say, I want to do this for you because I know that you're a young, struggling, poor pastor who drives a lousy car. He never said that, but I knew that's what was behind it. He was looking at my circumstance, and he was just considering me and things from my perspective, and he was just trying to do what he could to bring blessing to me. And Paul says, yeah, that's how I want you to interact. That's how it should look in the church also is really what he is saying. Now, this unity is not just on display in Paul's teaching, but also in Jesus' living. And Paul's intentional to point that out as we go on. Verse 3 says, For Christ did not please himself, but as it's written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. That might sound confusing. It's really just a quotation from Psalm 69 that Paul is taking and is borrowing and he's applying it to Jesus and what Jesus had gone through and the reproach that he had experienced at the hands of other people because that's what Jesus came to do. Jesus was enjoying all of the glories of heaven. It was a perfect environment there together with his father, but he chose to give that up and come into our world. Why would he do such a thing? 
because he was considering others. He was looking at circumstances from our vantage point. He knew that we needed something to assist us to get past where we were and out of his love and his compassion. He considered us came into our world. And what was the result? The result is that we might know unity. Unity between God and ourselves, between God and mankind. Kind. It's a beautiful thing. Verse 4 goes on. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. This is such a powerful statement from Paul. Paul is writing the New Testament. Essentially, he's living in the New Testament era. So when he talks about the Scriptures and this instruction that he wants people to live according to, he's pointing to the Old Testament. That's all that he had. And he's saying to this church that he is writing to, this New Testament church, that the Old Testament with the Scriptures, the Law, the Prophets, this all has such benefit for you, for the New Testament church. This is so important for us to understand because there are people today who would say, well, the Old Testament, that's the Old Testament. Now we have the New Testament. We have Jesus, and Jesus did away with the Old Testament and all of that. We don't need to worry about that stuff anymore. We're moving on, and that is so wrong. We've said that over and over again as we've looked at what Paul has to say in Romans about the law, and yes, there are some things that need to be interpreted through Jesus that need to be interpreted through the New Testament. We've talked about all of that. We're not going to belabor that today. But what he is saying is that there is so much there for us to take and learn from and take and apply. The Old Testament is still of great value. And we believe that. Just last year, we did a series just straight through, the verse by verse through the book of Ecclesiastes. We studied in the Psalms last year. Later on this fall, we're going to take a dip into another place in the Old Testament as well, and you can look forward to that. But Christian unity is a challenging endeavor he's talking about here because there are debatable matters where we've got different opinions and throw into the mix of that the fact that we are at different points in our spiritual walk and our spiritual maturity, and you've got this recipe for disunity. And Paul is writing to help us to get past that, to say even in the midst and even in that context, there are ways that we can find unity together with one another. So Paul works to do just that. And as he does, it's very telling that he does not come out and just give us a laundry list of how he would have us to think about different debatable topics. He doesn't bring one up and say, all right, now this is what you should do in that context. And another one, and, and this is what you should do, and this is how you should think in this context. Even if he was able to give such a list, which he wouldn't do because that would go against the, the whole premise of what he's talking about, that there are people at different points with different opinions and coming from different angles on these different things. So he wouldn't even do that to begin with. But even if he did, even if he could for the first century, that's great for the first century, but issues change. And they've continued to change. So he doesn't just give us instruction. He gives us a principle, a principle by which to operate. And that principle is, I always want you to live in consideration of others. He says in verse 1, it's an obligation. And as we do so, it'll be putting this unity into practice. Be putting this unity into practice. There is a value to pursuing unity with, with those whom we don't always see eye to eye. And this is so important, especially in our current climate today. See, more and more people are moving themselves into environments where there are tighter and tighter beliefs between themselves and other people, where we're moving and we're stepping into smaller and smaller enclaves where we share more and more and more things in common in terms of the way that we think and the way that we believe. It's happening all around us, and I get it. We feel at home there. It's easier to live there because you kind of agree with everybody who is there. And I understand the draw, but that's not unity. At least that's not biblical unity. That's just agreement. Biblical unity isn't about finding smaller and smaller circles of people where everyone agrees, but being able to live in larger circles where everyone doesn't. That's what biblical unity really looks like. And there's a real beauty there because it means the only way that that unity is come is that it's been born out of consideration for one person for another and back for the other person, people with whom we don't agree. Instead of having to say, well, I'm just going to have to keep retreating into this circle tighter and tighter and tighter, and you can never get into a perfectly tight circle because there's always going to be something. 
So Paul gives us a way that we might be able to live in that context. When it comes to unity, where we need it is in consideration with others. That's where he starts. He goes on. Next, he talks about when we see it, and that is in adoration of God. Unity leads to some interesting byproducts. Paul gets to that as he's continuing here. Verse 5, he, he writes, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is highlighting that unity in the midst of differences is possible because God has made it possible because of what Jesus has done, what Jesus has demonstrated on our behalf by opening up an avenue through which we might be united in his spirit, through his spirit, so that we might be able to march forward even when there are differences that otherwise might separate us. See, left to ourself, left to our own selfish desires, we're never going to achieve unity. In fact, we're not even going to want it because we'll be too focused on self and individualism. Paul says we can live, though, in the fullness of it because of the example that we have in Christ, but it's going to take effort, and it's going to take intentionality on our part to get that done. It's not going to just happen. Tim Keller writes, passive Christians will not experience much unity. If we're just sitting around waiting for unity to just kind of happen, or if we're waiting for other people to finally align their ideas and their beliefs with what we already believe, that's just a recipe for divisiveness. You're never going to get together. It's going to be failure instead. Unity requires getting beyond ourselves and working to find common ground, and that requires humility. And that's going to require some give and take of you with that person that you don't see eye to eye with. It doesn't mean that you're watering down any essentials of the faith, but it does mean choosing not to, have, not to allow matters that are secondary to separate us and to be the defining thing that says, all right, I'm out of here. If we can't agree on that one thing, then there's no point in us really hanging out together. So goodbye. And that's what's happened oftentimes in the church. And it's just a, it's just a scar on the body of Christ. The problem is that we're not very good at living with tension. When we walk into a situation where there is tension... Most of us have one of two immediate sort of knee-jerk reactions. One of those is we want to resolve it. And to resolve it, you're going to have to get one person to move their mindset into the mindset of the other person. And so there's oftentimes this conflict that happens as you want to resolve it. I know that personally, when I walk into that kind of situation, I'm kind of looking for the solution. How do we get everybody together? How do we make everybody happy with one another? It's kind of a natural reaction that I have. Another one that you might have, which is different from that, is to avoid it. Instead of trying to resolve it, you avoid it by saying, well, that's uncomfortable for me, and so I'll see you later. I don't want to be a part of that. But if those are the only two things that we've got in our arsenal for when it comes to times of conflict with one another, then we're always going to either be leaving a situation, we're avoiding it walking away, or we're going to be in this constant battle with people with whom we don't share or don't see eye to eye on whatever topic that might happen to be. And that happens all the time. And it's, again, it's a scourge on the body of Christ. It's what's been happening, though, among believers, and it leads to division and leads to animosity and it leads to church splits. And you might have experienced times when, when your desire is just to get out of that club or to get away from that team or maybe even to leave that church because you don't agree with something that has been said or something that has been done. But the truth is that we're always going to face tension. Romans 14 and 15, if they tell us anything, tell us to expect tension. Yes, even among your Christian brothers and sisters. Expect that it's going to happen. But again, Paul's solution isn't to get everybody to go in lockstep. He's trying to help them to come to understand how to navigate the tension when it comes up. How many of you have a sibling? Raise your hand. All right, that's most of you. You already know something about navigating tension, right? Because there's no living in a house with a sibling without there being some tension that arises, 
And how do you navigate that tension? For at least a, a stint in, in my growing up years, my parents seemed to think that the best way to navigate the tension that existed between us as siblings, I told you a little bit of this a while back, was to get us to kiss and make up. And for a 12-year-old boy, it is unbearable to entertain the idea of kissing your brother. And it's just as bad to think about kissing your sister. It doesn't matter. It did resolve some tension, the tension that our parents were feeling about the tension that we had, but it didn't do anything to resolve the tension between us as siblings. In fact, I think it probably just made it worse. Well, Paul is saying, I'm not just asking you to kiss and make up, to pretend like everything is fine. He said, I have a better solution for navigating tension. He tells us to consider others and not be a stumbling block to others. On debatable matters, he's saying that we should give enough grace to allow the person to hold a different opinion to the one that we hold and that that's okay. That that's okay. That we can find a way to navigate that tension and moving forward. You might say, well, that means you're always going to live in tension if that's the way it's going to be. And I'd say, well, yes and no. Yes, there may always be something underlying because you have a difference of opinion on something, but what unity does is it completely takes the stress out of tension. It takes the stress out of tension. It's not that the issue was resolved. It's not necessarily that you've come to see eye to eye on a particular topic, but you're not allowing it. You're taking the incendiary nature of it off the table because you're choosing to not allow that to be the thing that defines your relationship but instead to allow the priority of, of Romans 15 to learn to live in unity with one another, even where there are debatable issues that you disagree on, that you can take all of the sting out of that by choosing unity instead. That's what Paul's trying to get us to. And when that happens, the result is amazing. It brings a harmony, verse 5 tells us, that verse 6, together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This one voice adoration of God certainly involves the worship that we do together. When we get together, when we worship side by side, when we sing praises to God, worshiping side by side with others who don't necessarily share our views on everything might be the most beautiful expression of worship because we've arrived at that place not allowing those differences to stand in the way of us lifting up our God. We defile our worship with stubbornness, with a lack of love toward one another, with an insistence on a singular perspective, and it's got to be my perspective. And if we get there, then yes, I can worship side by side with you. That's not what he's saying here at all. God is marvelously praised when we choose to unite our hearts to give him glory, recognizing that our debatable differences aren't worth elevating over the honor of God. But how often do we do that? We allow ourselves to be separated, to not be able to come into fellowship with somebody else because we've got this thing that's between us. We're saying, that's more important to me than the unity Jesus is calling me to to be able to stand strong on my opinion on whatever this might happen to be. Remember, he's primarily talking about these debatable issues, whether they would be theological, whether they would be practical. We're willing to say, I feel so strongly about this that I'm sure that this is more important than Romans 15. Paul says, no, it's not. He says, it's a beautiful expression of worship when we come together. When is unity seen? It's seen in our adoration of, of God. And then lastly, how we live it in our imitation of Christ. It can be difficult to find great examples of what genuine unity looks like, so Paul just goes straight to the perfect one. Verse 7, Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God telling us to model our engagement with others in the way that Jesus modeled his engagement toward us completely, selflessly, sacrificially looking to our interests, leaving that which he could have claimed permanently as his own so that he might come out of consideration for who we are and what we 
needed. Then Paul goes on to show how Jesus did just that, verse 8. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised, that's just a little code word for the Jews, to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs. There he's just saying that Jesus came to serve the Jews, to show that God keeps his promises, but he didn't just come just for the Jews, verse 9, and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. It was revolutionary that the Gentiles would be invited into faith with Jesus. The Jews couldn't imagine that that was what God's plan was, but it was his plan. In fact, it had always been his plan. So Paul goes on in the, in the next several verses to quote from the Old Testament, showing that it's always been in God's ideas, always been in his plan. Verse 9 continues, as it is written, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again, it is said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with this people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Paul is writing to the Roman church that is a combination of both Jews and Gentiles. And what he is saying is that there is an adequate work that has been done on the part of Christ that you might, through his grace and through the gospel, come into this common faith. And through this common faith that you could experience unity with one another. That's what God has provided. He says that that is good enough to make unity work. But the question was still on Paul's mind as to whether or not it was going to actually work. Because he knew that there were still things in their background that was going to bubble up. There were going to be things that they were going to see differently. There were going to be things that they would just naturally walk into, respond in a situation, and it would be completely the opposite from the other person because of their background, because of where they had been. Jesus says that there is enough through the grace of Christ and through the common faith that you share to overcome that. But would they? It was a question. And Paul is essentially saying that if you won't, it's just a demonstration of your stubbornness and of your hard heart. And he's saying the same thing to us. That if we can't find a way forward with those that we don't necessarily agree with on these secondary matters, on these debatable issues, et cetera, et cetera, he says that's because of your stubbornness. That's because of your hard heart. The common faith we have in Christ through his sacrifice on the cross for our sin is the most important piece of all. He died so that we might be united to him and be united to one another and it is a bold de demonstration of arrogance and selfishness to elevate our personal preferences over his glory. Instead, we're called to imitate Christ, put unity on display, and that will require this consideration of the other person we've been talking about, seeing things from their point of view, experiencing some give and take along the way. I read about two churches. They were a very similar theological position, but they were both struggling to make ends meet, and so they, they met together and were talking about a merger of coming together so that they might be able to better manage their way through and just become one church. And they talked about that for a while, but in the end, they gave up the idea. They said it's untenable for us to be able to come together, and the issue was because they couldn't settle together on how they would recite the Lord's Prayer, whether it would be, Father, forgive our trespasses or forgive us our debts. The local new newspaper was covering it, and they wrote in the paper, so as a result, one of the churches is going back to their trespasses and the other is going back to their debts. Hard to imagine in one sense, but yet we look around us and we see that that happens all the time. Now, I understand that we all come to our convictions as a result of our upbringing, as a result of our background, of the people that we've encountered who have taught us a certain way, of the churches that we happen to be in growing up, which is the place where our parents put us, and we're a product of that, and, and I understand that, and I'm just not discounting that. I'm not saying that, that any of that necessarily needs to be thrown out. Showing consideration for others doesn't mean just that anything goes, and there are no standards anymore that we need to operate by. 
showing unity, putting unity on display doesn't mean that, that from now on it's just we just have to be totally tolerant of everybody and we just have to look the other way whenever there's sin. It's not saying any of those things at all, not even close to that, and there are definitely absolutes. But it does require that we would take a passage like Romans 15 and give it the weight that it does deserve as being a part of the Word of God. Instead of again saying, yeah, but I believe really strongly on this. And I know that God must honor my point of view on this. And so, so Romans 15 is just something that I can kind of set aside because of the significance of the issue that I'm holding on to. And yes, I know my brother in Christ holds it a different way, but they're, they're, they're wrong, and I'm just going to allow for the separation to happen and the division to exist because I feel that we don't have, we don't have the latitude to make that decision. We've got Romans 15 that tells us if there is something that is going on that is requiring me to be divided from my brother, that it's more likely that it's something to do with that which I feel so strongly about and the way that I'm elevating it above the Word of God. I'm not sure if you'd see yourself as being spiritually strong, being spiritually weak, and here's the thing. I'm not even sure it makes a difference or that it's that critical that we would sort out whether or not we are in the strong camp or we are in the weak camp. Because we may very well come to the conclusion, well, I'm in the strong camp because I know all of this and I've been in, in the church a very long time and it ends up just being kind of a pride thing, which means actually you're probably on the weak side of things. Or that you're so strong in understanding what you need to do and through that what everybody else needs to do and how they need to act, which is probably also a demonstration. You're probably on the weak side of things. And we can go back and forth and we can try to do the assessment and I'm not even sure that we can completely make the determination from our own point of view. Paul has put this great burden also on the strong to take the lead in fostering the unity and it's, it's more characterized by giving than it is by demanding. That'll mean letting go of some of the freedoms that we might have to keep others from stumbling, he is saying, and for this higher purpose. I think the better evaluation is to take inventory of how well we're showing consideration toward others. How well we're putting ourselves in the position of somebody else, how well we're working toward bringing people together and coming together with others instead of finding the things that can keep us separated and feeling justified in doing so. The strong take the lead in that. That is true from what we have been reading. But the weak aren't just given no responsibility. We were talking about earlier this idea of looking to the interest of others and not just your own. That's something that's given to just Christ's followers, regardless of how you would assess your strength or lack thereof. And if we will, what is going to happen is it's going, that his unity is going to be on display. So, what contribution are you making to the unity of the body of Christ? And specifically here at Pathway. What contribution are you making? Where are you leaning into relationships with others who don't look like you? Who don't think like you? Are you just tolerating those people? Or is there a determined unity that you're living out? through consideration because here's the thing if it's just a tolerance if you're just kind of putting up with them and thank goodness it's a big church and so I don't see them that often and so I don't I can kind of ignore them and that's how you've resolved the tension is but the tension is still there it's never been resolved and so really what happens when we're just tolerating instead of finding genuine unity it's still boiling it's just right under the surface and it's just waiting for one more thing to happen when it's going to bubble over. And that's going to be it. And you're going to be done. And if it's the right person who says the thing or makes the decision or takes the action, you may very well be in a spot where you're going to say, well, that's it. I'm done with that group. I'm done with that church. And we don't want that to happen. 
And Paul doesn't want that to happen. And so he gives us Romans 15 so that we know, might know how to navigate our way through this, is to navigate the issues that would otherwise divide us with consideration, putting unity on display. And so I would just encourage you, in this context in which we live today, where there's so much anger and vitriol and, and just words being thrown back and forth, and we see it all around us in our society, that we would resist allowing its creep into the church because it can happen. I've seen it happen right here in our midst. But when it happens, it doesn't bring glory to God. What it does is it brings a stain on the body of Christ, which ultimately, backing all the way up to the beginning, is going to hinder our witness, our mission. But as we are able to come together, as we're able to operate in unity despite differences. That is going to teach us, Romans 15, it's going to teach us what Paul's desire, what God's desire is for how we would interact. And it is going to bring us into a warmth and a fellowship and a harmony and certainly unity like we've never experienced before, and that's not only going to make this a winsome place internally, but externally, as we put unity on display. This is such a practical passage. It hits us right where we are. And so I just leave you to go on your way with this question on your mind. How are you engaging with people with whom you are otherwise perhaps at odds over issues, over ideas. Maybe it's theological, maybe it's practical. What are you doing to foster unity? You're not fostering unity by just going down a different hallway when you see them coming. That's not fostering any unity. It's when we come together with those with whom we do not see eye to eye and we have the conversation and acknowledge and affirm together that you're more important to me, that we might be in relationship. You're more important than me holding a position against you. Doesn't mean you change your position. It means you take the sting out of it because you want to live in harmony and in unity with that person because they are a brother or sister in Jesus Christ. That's what Paul is urging us to in Romans 15. It's a, it's a hard passage, and it's one that requires a lot of us, but it wanna, it's one I pray that we'd be able to embody more and more, and it's only going to bring glory to God as we do so, as well as benefit in relationship. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, you know the status of the world in which we live. You know the the pressures that are put on people. You know the models that we can look at and live by, and that's crept into the church in far too many places. Lord, I pray that we would overcome that. I pray that we would be a beacon that would demonstrate that whatever the circumstance, it's not something that we cannot overcome. It's not something through which we cannot find unity, and oneness. Father, I would pray that you would humble us, that you would help us to take the sting out of these issues that we've perhaps held so powerfully that it's, it's justified in our mind setting aside a call to unity. So Lord, help us to reflect to be reminded of circumstances that we have, of relationships that we have within the body and that we would be choosing to engage with those that we may not see eye to eye or we may be very different so that we might understand, so that we might be able to see from their perspective, so that we might be able to live with this consideration of others. Father, in your word, what you tell us right there at the end of the chapter 
is that as we can do these things, yes, we will be united as one, but it's through that that we can see and come to understand and experience hope, genuine hope, the hope of that which is to come, the hope of a life that goes beyond this one, the hope of interaction and relationship. They don't have to be torn apart like our world does. It tears us apart and we have all of these fractured relationships. Gives us a hope to overcome that. Not because of our abilities, but because of Jesus. That Jesus has come and that he has taken away the sting of death, the sting of all those things that would otherwise separate us and has given us a heart to be drawn to him and drawn to one another because it's a heart that is filled with the spirit of Christ and not our own selfishness. It's a heart that has taken on the, the fruit of the spirit and demonstrates that in all relationships. Lord, I pray that's what would mark us and that we too might feel and experience that hope and live it out. For your glory, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.
May the God of peace, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him that you may overflow with hope, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Have a great rest of your day, and we will see you next weekend. Thank you again for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you again soon, whether it's here on campus or right here online. Have a wonderful week, everybody.